If you'd open your Bibles to Colossians 3, John said I could take as much time as I wanted. <laughs> I said, you should never say that to me. Um, my wife, Julie, who I can't wait to see this afternoon, or actually tonight, um, says to me often, I said to me, don't you ever get tired of talking? And I say, no. <laughs> Just not a good way to start a message. All right. Colossians 3, I'm most concerned not about talking, but about sharing God's word with you. You don't need to be a very observant person to realize that most people like to sing. We, we sing a lot. You have these shows like American Idol, The Voice, where people just, millions, just tune in to watch people singing. Uh, we sing at birthdays and weddings and funerals. We sing at sporting events. We sing in choirs. We, we go to watch musicals. We sing in the shower. We sing in the car. But Christians especially like to sing, whether it's a, a chorus, a, you know, a worship chorus or a traditional hymn, whether it's a modern worship song. Christians sing. And the, the title of my message this morning is, Why Do We Sing? That's what we're going to be looking at from God's Word. Why do we sing? Because when the church gathers to sing, it's different from any other kind of singing that we do. And if you're here this morning and starting to check out because you think, eh, I don't really like singing, I hope that God will work in your heart this morning to reveal to you by the end of this message that you, too, have a reason to sing. Daniel Levitin is a scientist and a musician who wrote a book I read a few years ago called This Is Your Brain on Music. And he attempts to explain why music plays such a significant role in our lives and why we like the music we do. So in one chapter called My Favorite Things, he, he, he tells us why we're drawn to certain kinds of music and says, one of the things he says is before we're born, when we're in the womb, we, we are affected by the music we hear in the womb. By age two, we've adapted to the music of our culture. So a two-year-old in Moscow is going to like different music than a two-year-old in Mumbai is going to like different music from a two-year-old in Minneapolis. As we get older, we get tired of simple, predictable nursery, -like nursery songs, and we start to prefer more complex music because we can understand it. And then when we hit the teen years, and I see a number of teens in here, our, our active brains and hormones assign exaggerated importance to everything, which is why when you're in your 60s, the music that affects you the most is often still the music that you loved in high school because it was so significant to you. Now, you don't have to be an expert in music or have a degree in music to know what kind of music you like. We all have, well, a lot of people have strong preferences about music, even with no musical knowledge. And we bring those preferences often into church. We like certain songs, or we like certain bands, or music by certain artists, or certain tempos. Uh, we only worship to simple songs, or old songs, or new songs, or wordy songs. And we have, I mean, this, even in this a congregation this size, there are a lot of different preferences in regards to music. But have you ever wondered, what kind of music does God like? And it's not enough to say, well, he likes everything. I'm sure there's some music that God doesn't like. I've heard it. <laughs> How does God think about the music that we use when we come together? Does, does he even like it? I have had this nightmare where I imagine dying and going to heaven and finding out that like, the music of heaven is opera. And just thinking, oh my gosh. But I'm, I'm sure I'll have a glorified body. I know I will, and it'll be fine. Um, is there a purpose for singing that we might be missing? So do we, do we just kind of walk through that first part and go, yeah, that's okay. That's good. Why worship God in song at all? Why don't we come in and just like recite things together or shout things together or, or read silently together? What is it about singing that is so important to God? Well, rather than talk about our experiences and our preferences, we're going to go to God's Word. We're going to look at Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. 
Just a little background before we read it. One of the reasons Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians was because they were being influenced by false teachers. They were being told that you need to add something to Christ, that Christ isn't enough. To be really pleasing to God, you need to add something to Christ. And anytime you add something to Christ, you take something away because you can't add anything to Jesus to make him better. So Paul wants them to be clear on who Jesus is and what the gospel is. So if, if you sat down and read through Colossians this afternoon, you would see that Paul is all about letting us know, helping us understand why Jesus is so important to our lives. In chapter 1, he says that Jesus has reconciled a people and really all things to God through his blood shed on the cross. So out of the gate, he's, he's, he's telling the Colossians, look, Jesus has done something no one else has done. He's reconciled a people to God through his death on the cross. Chapter 2, he fills that out and says, we're to be rooted in Christ. We're to walk in him and be built up in him. And at the end of chapter 2, he's given all kinds of warnings to the Colossians about not adding something to Christ. In chapter 3, he starts talking about what it looks like to be in Christ. He says, we have been raised up with Christ, and now he is our life. So what does it look like? To live a Christ-exalting life in the midst of a, an unbelieving society. And in the midst of that, he talks about what role music plays in that process. And he, he's, he, the, in the verses we're going to look at, especially the last two, he's going to help us understand how music helps us to live a Christ-exalting life in the midst of a pagan culture. And we're going to see that we worship God together in song to deepen the relationships we enjoy through the gospel with God and with each other. That's why we sing. If you want to sum this message up in a sentence, it's we worship God together in song to deepen the relationships we enjoy through the gospel with God and with each other. Singing is more than just a warm-up to the sermon. It's, it's more than just a means of drawing crowds. There are a lot of churches today that use their music to draw people. It's meant to be more than just a highly charged emotional experience or a platform for frustrated musicians who can't get a gig on Saturday night. <laughs> it's meant to deepen the relationships we enjoy through the gospel. And I hope that'll become clear to you as we walk through this passage. I'm going to read it. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. And as I was reading this this morning, I was freshly affected by the fact that God would be so kind as to put his thoughts and words to us in writing so that we don't have to wonder, what does God think? He, he's told us what he thinks. And this is, this is infallible. This is, this is inerrant. This is sufficient for our joy and for living a life that pleases God. So let's hear from God, starting in verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So he's already, he's already reminding them of who they are in Christ. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on Love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, we ask that you would help us now 
hear your heart, to hear your words, that we might be freshly amazed by your mercy and grace to us in Jesus, and that we may understand better why we sing as your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at three reasons as to why, from this passage as to why God wants us to sing. Here's number one. To impress the gospel of Christ on our minds. To impress the gospel of Christ on our minds. So we're going to focus on verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now he could just jump to singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but he doesn't do that. He inserts this, teaching and admonishing one another. That, that, that takes our minds, teaching and admonishing one another. And when he talks about the word of Christ, it's the word about Christ or the gospel that is to dwell in us richly as we sing. Christ is to be the center of our singing. One theologian put it like this, Christ is the ground and the content of Christian song. Christians sing about Christ. If they sing about God, it is especially what God has done through Christ. If about the Holy Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit as the gift of Christ. If about instruction to one another, it is the life in Christ. Did you notice this morning how we started off with, um, what's that song called? Holy is the Lord. It's a great song, but did you realize it doesn't reference Christ at all? So if you're going to sing songs like that, and that's all you ever sing, someone could wonder, is this a Christian church? But we didn't do that. We, we went on to focus on specifically on Jesus and who he is and what he does. But if we're not aware of that, you can walk into a church and sing songs that never really talk much about what Jesus did. So this is an important point. The word of Christ is to dwell in us richly. And the focus here is teaching and admonishing one another. It's a mental activity. It, it describes the horizontal element of our singing. We're not just singing vertically. We're singing horizontally. We're teaching and admonishing one another so that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly. Do you guys have Cinnabon here? I'm sure you do. In the mall? Sometimes I'll be walking through a mall and I will suddenly be overtaken by this smell. And it's not Yankee Candle Company, which I really don't prefer as I walk by that. It's yeasty, it's doughy, it's sugary, it's cinnamony, cinnamony, and it's really, really good. And sure enough, like within 100 feet, I'm standing there in front of a Cinnabon. And it's a wonderful experience. But here's what I'll often think. Better than smelling the Cinnabon is having a Cinnabon dwelling in me richly. <laughs> it's a totally different experience. You know what I'm talking about, especially the middle part. It's like, oh, it's so good. I could use one right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's, that's what Paul's saying about the gospel. We're not just to like, come in and smell the gospel. We're not just to come in and hear about the gospel. We're to like engage our minds and really think about it in such a way that the word of Christ affects us, it influences us, and it governs our lives. So, so why the mention of music? And in particular, how does music impress the gospel of Christ on our minds? So I've thought about that a lot. It's what I do. I just sit around thinking, why? How does music help impress the gospel of Christ on our minds? Well, one of the reasons it does that is that singing helps us remember words. That's the way God designed music. And scientists are just beginning to understand how that works. God made our brains to recognize and categorize and remember patterns in music better than in just words alone, which is why when our kids were growing up, we didn't just memorize Bible verses. I had them sing Bible verses, and they still sing those today. In fact, some of my kids have taught their kids songs that they learned as kids. Well, if I had just told them it, it wouldn't have left that impact. We sang it. This is why people get paid so much money to write jingles that stick in your head and will not leave. 
And sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. It's why my mother-in-law, when she started getting, when she had dementia, uh, didn't know who I was, but could sing songs she had learned as a teenager. You start a song that she had learned, you know, 70 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, she jumped right in. That's how music works. In Deuteronomy 31, when Israel was on the verge of the promised land, Moses was about to lead Israel into the promised land, God tells Moses to teach them a song. And in verse 21, he tells them why. It's so that, and this song depicted how Israel was going to follow idols. So God says, teach them this song so that when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. Isn't that amazing that God tells Moses to teach the Israelites a song to teach to their children so that it will convict them later on? Music enables us to remember words. It also helps us to meditate on, on truths or reflect on truths differently than when we just speak words. It can uh, stretch out words. And, and just give us time to ponder them. So I could say to you, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Okay, that took what? Eight seconds? I don't know. Okay, you should time this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hang on that word so we remember that we're the wretches. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So that took like five, six times as long as when we said it. But didn't you hear it better? Didn't you like catch better what it was saying? Music helps just kind of stretch the words out. It, it gives us time for reflection in between lines. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. Those little spaces in between, you just get, have a little moment to reflect on what you're singing. Sometimes it's repetition that we can where we can repeat words without sounding like we're idiots. So if I said, it is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, <laughs> you're just thinking, what's his problem? <laughs> just getting back from Mexico, having trouble thinking. Uh, but it sounds totally normal when we sing it. It is well, it is well. You can participate. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. And we'll do that four times, sometimes five times. And no one has ever turned around and gone, why are we repeating this so much? <laughs> like, can't we just, we do it once? We say it once, it's good, we got it. It's well with my soul. No, if, you, if that's how you're thinking, it's not going to get in you richly. It's not going to dwell in you richly. And that's what God wants the gospel to do. Singing is meant to impress the gospel of Christ on our minds. That's different from having musical experiences dwell in us richly, okay? God doesn't say that. Let musical experiences dwell in you richly as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Music can affect us emotionally. It's an emotional language, and it can affect us in, in, in a lot of different ways. Produce awe, gratefulness, joy, tears, without any, any words at all. Is this on? Okay, so I could just do, you know...
Now, apart from putting you to sleep, what, what emotions does that music suggest? And this is congregation participation time. There are no wrong answers. Comfort, peace. Yet yeah, Christmas? I hadn't thought of that. I could have made it more Christmassy. Okay, yeah, so, so if you're in that category, no one's saying celebration, uh, or no one's saying anger, or scariness. You know, there's a, there's a, a range of emotion that that music suggests. Let's, let's just take peace. You have no idea why I'm peaceful. And I may not be peaceful at all, but it might be because I'm tired and I just want to play something soft. You have no idea unless there are words attached to it. So music is meant to serve the words. It's the word of Christ that's to dwell in us richly. That's why Paul says we're teaching and admonishing one another as we sing. We're not just making each other feel good. There is a certain feel good. In fact, there's a chemical that our minds produce when we sing together that makes us feel unified, makes us feel better. That's not what Paul's talking about. That's not what God's talking about. He's saying, I want the gospel to dwell in you richly as you sing. Now, obviously, that's not the only time the word of Christ is meant to dwell in us richly, but it is saying that when we sing, that's what's supposed to happen. And it also means that when we sing, we are to sing about who Jesus is and what he's done. We're not just singing happy songs about God. We're singing about the fact that the Son of God left his throne in glory, took on human skin, lived a perfect life, suffered on a cross, died on a cross to bear the sins of all those who would ever trust in him. He received the wrath of God in their place. He took their punishment. He took their condemnation so that by believing in him, they could have life eternal. They could be forgiven. They could be justified before God. They could be adopted into his family and look forward to Jesus coming back for them when they will spend eternity with him enjoying eternal pleasures at his right hand. That's what we're singing about. That's a great story. It's the gospel. It's true. And if you get a picture of that when you're singing, that's the word of Christ dwelling in you richly. And if you don't get that, then we're not singing the right way. That's what's meant to dwell in us richly. As worshipers, we're responsible to focus on the truths we're singing more than the music we're hearing. So that could go either way. That, that could go, yeah, I just really don't like you know, what that bongo player's playing. I just, yeah, it's just not my style. That's focusing more on the music. Or it could be, Oh, man, that guitar riff, that was incredible. I love that. I hope he does that again. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, I love that. that. Both of those examples are seeking to have musical experiences dwelling in you richly. God says, no, I want you to focus on what you're singing, or the truths that you're singing. So the music kind of goes and, and, and fills its rightful place. It's the word of Christ that's to dwell in us richly. And if you get this, it'll change the way you sing. It'll change the way you come in here on Sunday mornings thinking, yeah, we're just going to sing. Oh, no, 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 no. We're going to have the word of Christ dwell in us richly. It's so, so great. So worship and song deepens our relationship with God because it impresses the gospel of Christ on our minds. Point two, we sing together to impress the gospel of Christ on our hearts. We are, in verse 16, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In fact, three times in this, these, short, these six verses, Paul talks about thankfulness, thankfulness, thankfulness. We're to be thankful, grateful people. So singing is not only an educational event, as we just talked about. It's an emotional event. And why is it so emotional? Why, why should it be emotional? Well, if the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly, it's because we're realizing how good God has been to us. We're seeing in a fresh way that although we deserve to be headed for hell, God sent his son to take our place. Although we deserve to be separated from God for eternity because of all the sins that we've done, God sent Jesus to do that for us. And he didn't have to be separated for eternity. He just has to be separated once. And that happened on the cross. And we cannot look at that story, that picture, that event, and not respond with gratefulness. 
it's, it's like, you know, you find out you have a, a terminal disease and you're going to die in five days. And someone comes up to you and says, I, I just discovered the cure for your disease. What are you going to do? Say, uh, yeah, okay, great. Thank you. No, you're going to take that medicine and you're going to say, praise God that I'm not dying in five days. Well, the gospel is just a little bigger than that. It's a little more important than that, a little more significant than that because it's not physical life we're talking about. We're talking about eternal life versus eternal condemnation. So as we sing about these things, how can we help but be thankful for what God has done? So uh, Gordon Fee, another theologian, says about when we sing, how it's, we're singing about God's grace, we're singing about his kindness, and we say, thus the focus is not so much on our attitude toward God as we sing, but on our awareness of his attitude toward us that prompts such singing in the first place. A lot of times we think it's all about what we do, and we've got to feel like singing to sing. No, you don't. No, we can sing as a means of stirring up our emotions because singing does two things. It both expresses our emotions and it engages our emotions. It stirs them up. Singing is a beautiful and powerful way of expressing our gratefulness as we consider the grace that God has shown us in Christ. It, it really gives us opportunity to say more thoroughly and more comprehensively and more emotionally how grateful we are. So I came across this quote by John Piper, author, theologian, pastor, uh, who has influenced millions to love Jesus more. Uh, and he said, the reason we sing is because there are depths and heights and intensities and kinds of emotions that will not be satisfactorily expressed by mere prosaic forms, just, just regular paragraphs, or even poetic readings. There are realities that demand to break out of prose into poetry, and some demand that poetry be stretched into song. Do you know why we don't come in here and just talk about things? Because the reality is so amazing. It's why there are musicals. Why are there musicals? Why is Alexander Hamilton so popular? Well, it's a great story. That's for one reason. But the music is amazing. And when you hear those words put to music, it's like, oh, it's, yes, those words need to be sung, not just talked about. And we accept it. We say, yeah, of course, that's totally natural for somebody to be talking along. Then all of a sudden, to be singing to someone. And if you ever tried that in a Starbucks, you would be hurried out and said, get out of here. But we accept it because... We, it makes sense to us. There are some realities that demand to break into song. But on the other side, singing also encourages our affections. It stirs up our affections. One of the greatest American theologians, Jonathan Edwards, said a few hundred years ago, the duty of singing praises to God seems to be holy, given holy to excite and express religious affections. There is no other reason why we should express ourselves to God in verse rather than in prose and with music, except that these things have a tendency to move our affections. Has it ever happened to you that you have walked into a meeting feeling kind of out of place and not quite together, even sad, even disconnected, and as the singing starts, you find like two or three songs in, you're seeing things differently? And you start to sing with, with emotion and, and affection, and you start, just start to sing. Well, that's what's happening. You're hearing the singing, and it's affecting you. That's what, that's what singing can do. And we're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, which I've read a lot of commentaries on what that means, and I've come to the conclusion that we don't know. We don't know exactly what Paul was saying, but at the very least, we can assume that he's talking about the variety, a variety of music, a variety of words. Uh, biblical worship in the Bible can be simple, it can be complex, it can be spontaneous, it can be planned, it can be with a group, it can be alone, it can be with instruments, without. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can sing. But here's what we need to realize. There's not one single style of music that sufficiently captures the glory of God. It's not modern rock. It's not traditional hymns. It's not jazz. It's not folk. It's not alternative. 
Well, you pick the music. There's no one style of music that can, that can adequately express all the glory of God. And from our perspective, there's no one style that can fully express all the appropriate responses to God's glory. So some churches, they just do very stately, slow songs the whole time. And if you're, you know, if you're not feeling that well or your life's hard, that can be, that can be helpful. Other churches, they just do fast, exciting, celebrating songs all the time. And if you have just lost your job, or if you're struggling with a, a teen who's like walking away from the Lord, that's not exactly where you're at. So we need a variety of songs to express appropriate responses to God. And the main point is that we want to express our gratefulness in as many ways as we can. And the main thing we're expressing is thankfulness. Music can be used to express a lot of emotions, sorrow, repentance, awe, peace, trust. We see that in the Psalms. But on this side of the cross and the resurrection, our songs are going to be characterized most often by joy. Now, it's not necessarily a, uh, just, just a shallow, I mean, it's not a shallow happiness. It's not, you know, everybody, to be a part of Redemption Hill, you have to be an extrovert. Because when we sing, we just sing really loud. If that's not what the scripture is saying. Scripture is saying that when we come in, it should dawn on us that our blessings exceed our trials. Because Jesus Christ has come. And he bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's what should overtake us. That's what should characterize us. Are singing. And when the Bible talks about, when this passage talks about with thankfulness in your hearts, hearts means in, in Scripture our whole being. It's not just this little secluded part of us. It's our whole being. We're not singing just with our voices. We're singing so that we are engaged. Hearts includes what we do with our faces and our bodies. And when I'm singing anywhere with the church, I'm always, there, there'll be certain times I just look around and just see what people are doing. And you guys are doing this, mostly. Um, not everyone. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 5 says, Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. Sometimes you should sing a worship song in front of a mirror just to see what you're doing. No, don't do that. Be, that would be awkward. Um, but you should ask yourself the quest, this question. Do people see how great Jesus is from the way I'm singing? Would they pick up, like someone who walked into the room and saw me, would, would they pick up, like, how amazing I think Jesus is and how glorious is it and, and how merciful and how kind he's been to me? It's one of the reasons whenever I'm with a band, I have opportunity to play with bands in different contexts. I'm always encouraging the instrumentalists to sing because it's saying, you know, I'm not just grooving on my music, on my riff, on, on what I'm laying down here. I'm, I'm amazed by what we're singing, and that's what's bringing this music forth. All right, so it's both mind and heart. We've got the mind, we've got the heart, and singing helps us, it's really amazing, combine objective truth with thankfulness, deep truths with engaged emotions, doctrine with devotion, intellect with emotion, our heads and our hearts. So we don't want to set great truths to dull music or really engaging music that has shallow words. We want both. We want songs that are theologically compelling and engaging, as well as emotionally stimulating. God intends to impress the gospel both on our minds and our hearts. And there's a third reason we sing. We sing together as a church to impress the gospel of Christ on our lives. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul makes it clear that the gospel isn't just simply something we're to sing about. We're to live in light of it. It's to affect every part of our lives. We're to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And there are different ways that happens. Singing, for one, deepens our unity in Christ. It reminds us that we are one. We're a people. 
And throughout Scripture, you see, God's never just interested in individuals alone. He's interested in a city. He's interested in a temple. He's interested in a body. He's interested in a people. We are part of a people. And singing helps manifest that. It helps show it. And just a, uh, one of the verses we read this morning were verse, was verse 14. Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. Paul uses a musical term to describe what we're to be like. And singing is a manifestation of that. We're one, not because we like the same kind of music, but because Jesus has broken down the dividing walls that were between us. One person said, private acts of public worship are a contradiction in terms. We don't come here just to make it about me and Jesus. It's about us and Jesus. And it's glorious. It's glorious. Another way that singing leads us to live, to impress the gospel of Christ on our lives, is that it reminds us what life is all about. We come in here and we get a jolt of, of what's true, of what's real, of what really matters. Doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus means doing everything in light of what Jesus has accomplished at the cross. So here's some examples. We're reminded that there's nothing more we can do to earn God's forgiveness. We shared earlier. We are no longer under condemnation. So we sing, When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end of all my sin We're not just singing that so we remember it now We're singing that so we remember it tomorrow And Tuesday and Wednesday and all the other days of the week That's why we're singing that to each other And then we we remind ourselves that our suffering is never wasted. It has purpose. It has meaning. No guilt. We're saying this this morning. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Who? Jesus commands my destiny. Love this. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. That's truth for living, folks. That's something that we can pull up any time this week when we're feeling like our lives hurtling out of control and say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. No, what is it, scheme of, what is it, no, power of hell, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. That includes right now. That's why we sing to remember that the gospel of Christ is impressed on our lives. We have confidence in our battle against sin and the flesh. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on him. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. So it reminds us, singing reminds us of what life is all about. And then finally, singing together prepares us for the life to come. Singing together is one of the clearest foretastes we have of the powerful, glorious, unending songs around the throne. And our singing reflects that song. Now, I guarantee you it's going to be a lot better in the new heavens and the new earth. Everybody's going to be in tune. We're going to know it's just going to be a lot better. Trust me. Because right now, we're limited. It's not going to be, it's not now like it's going to be then. We're limited in our time and in our understanding, and in our strength. But one day, time's not going to run out. You know, we'll be singing for a while, a couple weeks maybe, and then say, hey, let's sing another song. Hey, let's do the... It won't matter. We, we'll have eternity. We'll have clearer understanding. We'll, we'll see Him as He is. We'll be like Him, First John says. And then we'll have glorified bodies. You know, we can, we'll be able to raise our hands for like, you know, 10 years and not get tired. Some of us might raise our hands for the first time, but you'll be able to keep them up because we'll have glorified bodies. It'll be so, so different. So what will it be like? What will it be like when we hear and sing songs like we've never heard and sung them before? When we finally see the one we're singing to? 
You know, when we sing about seeing the Lord face to face, we can't do that now. But one day we will. One day we will. And there's a man named Randy Alcorn who has written a lot about heaven. And in one of his books, Edge of Eternity, he, he imagines what that will be like. And he writes this. The army began to sing, perhaps hundreds of thousands, perhaps a million. I added my voice to theirs and sang the unchained praises of the king. Only for a moment did I hear my own voice, amazed to detect the increased intensity of the whole. One voice, even mine, made a measurable difference. That's true here, too. But from then on, I was lost in the choir, hardly hearing my voice and not needing to. Our voices broke into 32 distinct parts, and instinctively, I knew which one of them I was made to sing. We sing for joy at the work of your hands. We stand in awe of you. It felt indescribably wonderful to be lost in something so much greater than myself. There was no audience, I thought for a moment, for audience and orchestra and choir all blended into one great symphony, one grand cantata of rhapsodic melodies and powerful sustaining harmonies. No. Wait, there was an audience. An audience so vast and all-encompassing that for a moment I'd been no more aware of it than a fish is aware of water. I looked at the throne, and upon it sat the king, the audience of one. The smile of his approval swept through the choir like fire across dry wheat fields. When we completed our song, the one on the throne stood and raised his great arms and clapped his scarred hands together in thunderous applause shaking ground and sky, jarring every corner of the cosmos. His applause went on and on, unstopping and unstoppable. And in that moment, I knew with unwavering clarity that the king's approval was all that mattered and ever would. The king's approval is all that mattered and all that ever would. It's all that ever will matter. We... We sing for the glory and the honor and the pleasure of Jesus Christ who has given us every reason to sing. And as the word of Christ dwells richly in our minds and our hearts, the relationships we enjoy through the gospel with God and each other are deepened for our good and for his glory. Worshiping God in song isn't, isn't just a nice idea or something that's meant for musically trained people. It's for every Christian. Because I read once that the question is not, has God given me a voice? But has God given me a song? And if you're an individual whose sins have been completely washed away, paid for by the willing death of the Son of God. And if because of him you know God and you are looking forward to spending eternity with him, God has given you a song to sing. How can you not sing? How can we not sing? And it's a song that is going to continue throughout eternity for the glory of the triune God. And all this we do right now, it's just dress rehearsal. It's just getting ready for that day. And I don't want to get to heaven and go, oh, we're supposed to be focusing on Jesus? I thought singing was about how I sounded or how it made me feel. No, no, it's about Jesus and how glorious he is. So how can we do anything right now but sing? So we're going to sing together. And let me tell you what we're going to do. Uh, and obviously, I, I pray that what we've been talking about is going to affect you next week, or even tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next week. But we're going to respond right now, and we're going to sing All Creatures of Our God and King, just with the piano. Because one of the things we can subtly be deceived in is thinking that, like, the people up here are the ones who are really doing it, and we're just kind of, like, adding to their sound. That's not the way it works. 
You are the sound. You are the ones that God is listening to. Musicians, dime a dozen. You can find them anywhere. You guys, a heart that has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ that has a song to sing. You know, there are over 50 direct commands in the Bible to sing to God. All through the psalm, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. So we're going to sing to the Lord. And I want to encourage you to think of the words we're singing and allow the truths that we're singing to, to affect your heart. Because this particular song, and we might sing another, I know it's kind of late, um, this particular song is about inviting all creation to sing with us. It's not enough to sing by ourselves. So let's stand together. Mm. I, I know we've gone a, a bit long, but I'd like to <laughs> pray just real briefly at the end here. The Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville uh, is currently... Um, hoping and looking for uh, more of a, a permanent building. Yes. So it's coincidental that we're both facing the same need yes, at the same we time. Are. Yes, um, we are. And since we don't usually have a chance to literally pray for one of their pastors, I thought we could just pray that God would provide for them oh, uh, in this way, that they're not having to move all over the city <laughs> to find a place to meet, which we can appreciate. Um, so let's just pray together for their church and for these pastors that God would meet them in that way. Thank but we just thank you so much for Bob. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the gift he is. Thank you for the impact he has on our church every week. Uh, we want to be grateful to you for him. And Lord, we pray for this current need that their church is facing. Lord, please provide them a place to meet. Lord, miraculously, uh, Lord, it, we, swiftly, Lord, as they start this building fund, as they're looking to the future, Lord, we just pray to meet their immediate needs and also their long-term needs. Lord, they just want to have a place to gather where they can worship you, sing to you, hear your word. And Lord, we love them. We have received so much from them, yes. and Lord, we, we want to see you meet them powerfully in this way. So Lord, please do. Lord, we know they're trusting you, but we just pray for that dear congregation that you'd bless them. Mm -hmm. And bless Bob as he goes home. Lord, bless his travel. Bless his strength. Keep him as he continues to serve our churches, writing music and helping songwriters and musicians. Lord, be with him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.